as we continue through our tour in the book of First Corinthians here, um, I really wrestled here. I've been wrestling actually with the last couple of weeks. The Lord took me to a different part of the passage we're going to be in today. And uh, I've never preached out of that portion of the passage before. And uh, um, I was trying to dial in, God, how do you want this to go? Um, and um, so I don't know how this morning is going to go. We'll see. I did have one large cup of coffee. It was, uh, it, it was big enough to hold two pots. So uh, we're all good. Uh, question, I'm going to start off this morning with this question. Do you keep score? That's the opening question here as we journey again through 1 Corinthians. We're in chapter 1. Uh, we're going to be at that scripture later in the service. Um, uh, and and uh, the subject matter of this text uh, relates to uh, that question, do you keep score? But I'm going to jump a little bit ahead in 1 Corinthians as uh, there's a passage of scripture uh, in uh, chapter 9 that's related to the topic for this morning's uh, message. Do you know that those, do you know that all who run the race run to win, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the game exercises self-control in all things. Think about an Olympic athlete and how they exercise self-control to get to that level. That's what Paul's talking about. Remember the Isthmus games here. They then do it, and listen, they exercise self-control so well as Olympians, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we in imperishable. The point Paul's making there is, how well do we run? Do we compare ourselves to an Olympic athlete that runs that well for the imperishable wreath? Because they're running for the perishable one. And back then it was just a wreath that uh, uh, was put on their head and it was made of, uh, um, uh, it was made of uh, flowers, uh, basically, vine and flowers. Therefore, Paul says, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture because I'm a competitor. And to be totally honest with you, you can ask any one of my family members. That'll cost me money. You can ask any one of my family members that I, about my liking to win. Okay? Um, I'm driven to win. The Apostle Paul and I are kindred, kindred spirits on the idea of winning and success. I'm sure many of you are kindred spirits with the Apostle Paul as well in this area of winning. I don't know if I have ever met somebody, at least I haven't done this myself, I don't know if I've ever met somebody who woke up and said, today I think I'll be in second place. That's what I'm shooting for. I don't know if I've, I've never met anybody. Do. Even in our spiritual lives, in, we don't shoot for runner-up. We, like Paul, want to run the race to win. We want, so what ends up happening, I'll be honest with you, is we keep score. Okay? Um, uh, and you, I think scorekeeping, we keep score in a lot of things. And, and this is partly my, my confession to you this morning, that I keep scoring a lot of things. We can keep score about how our friends treat us. We could keep score about how our coworkers think of us. We could keep score about how our family members handle us. We could keep score about how our spouse feels towards us. I didn't hear an amen on that one. We could keep score about how our friends have more than we have. That idea is called keeping up with the Joneses. We can keep score about how much someone makes, how much more they make than us. We can keep score about how someone else raised their children versus the way we raised ours. I didn't hear an amen on that one. <laughs> amen? We can keep score regarding the things of God as well. Here's one relevant area where we can keep score, where you currently physically sit. Listen, we can keep score on whether Sunday morning service was good for me or it wasn't. Ooh. Did Sunday morning service meet my needs and tickle me the right way? Or did it not? Was it a good service this morning or was it bad? I won't be at the door, so you don't have to give me the answer to that question on the way out this morning. All right? Because I'll be honest with you, I have an audience of one who's keeping score. It's him. And I preach what he puts on my heart. We could keep score about Sunday morning service. We could keep score 
about how God appears to bless others while not blessing us, we can keep score. Listen, we can go this far. We can keep score related to someone else's score. We can look at somebody else and say, I'm not so sure they're in because of how they perform as a believer. So now we're keeping score for them. We can be their Holy Spirit, amen? We can keep that score. As you can see, there's any number of ways that we can keep score in life. I would argue this, this morning, and I am, that keeping score isn't a bad thing as long as we're keeping score about the right things, amen? Keeping score is all right if it's done properly, meaning that it's done, the tally for keeping score is done from a basis of Scripture. Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 23, these words, Whatever you do, do your work heartily as unto the Lord rather than to men. Remember, you folks, I just want to let you know, you have an audience of one. Okay? We all have an audience of one, not just me. Whatever you do, do as unto the Lord, not to men, knowing that the Lord, from the Lord, you will receive your reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. This is a good way to keep score. Are you working towards doing all that you do heartily. By the way, that word actually means this, passionately that you're all in, in whatever it is. You're passionately all in. For the, and you're in because of the Lord, not for men. Okay? Listen, I'm not in my marriage relationship because of my wife. I'm in it because God called me to be in my marriage relationship the way he ordained it. Amen? And listen, that's what sustains my relationship. If that wasn't, isn't what, if I'm in just for her, meeting all of her needs so that I don't upset her or this and that, we're in trouble. Because I mess up all the time. Amen? I have to be in as pleasing unto him. The old saying goes like this, if something is worth doing, it's worth doing right. Amen? Personally, all in, in the biblical way, you can keep score all in in a biblical way. In my opinion, it is all in. That's what Paul just said. I'm doing all things as unto the Lord because it is him who I serve. Here's another example that might be familiar to you that I've mentioned often and a lot of times here recently. Here's an all in question, a, a, a good way to measure. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. He said, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the words of truth. Keeping score, keeping score about how accurately you handle God's word as you study it and you apply it to your life, being a diligent workman. And further, applying it to the life of somebody else because he's called us to make disciples. That, so the follow-up question related to that keeping scores, do you know the Bible well enough to apply it to your life in all situations as unto the Lord and to speak it accurately in situations with others as God has divinely ordained all of your works, all of your good works before the foundation of the world, God has ordained. And do you accurately handle the word of God so that not only does it speak into your life, but you can speak it into the lives of others as unto God. All in. All right, I'll challenge the youth here this morning. How are you demonstrating Christ to other people, speaking the words of truth into the lives of somebody who's totally lost in sin, your friends at school? Because that's our calling if we're professing believers as teenagers or even younger if you're here and you're saved, how are you doing that? Kids, young adults. I just realized I'm really old when the young adult thing quit at 25. Whew, sorry. That was a side thought. Probably shouldn't have happened. Keeping score regarding being all in spills out in a number of biblical areas. Just quickly, are you all in in making disciples? Are you all in in determining your spiritual gifting? And then this, are you all in imply, uh, implying that gifting, using that gifting in the body of Christ that God gave you? There's scripture basis for all of that. I'll give you one more example from scripture regarding biblically being okay to keep score and being all in, if I can say it that way, from this same book of 1 Corinthians. Listen to these words. Love is patient. Love is kind. And is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked. 
does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Are you all in loving biblically this way? See, that's a, in my opinion, that's a great, I can keep score on that deal. By the way, I mess it up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we say that at marriage a lot of times, but this, it has more to do than just marriage. It has what to do for our entire life. Are you all in loving biblically? You know, Jesus said you'll know them by what? Their love for one another. You see, this text is not just a wedding text. In fact, it wasn't written as a wedding text. It was written to a, cur- a church that wasn't loving one another. They weren't doing it this way. That's why he wrote it to the church at Corinth. Okay, are you all in loving biblically? Do you always act in love this way towards others, especially others? Listen, this is the really difficult question. Especially others who have stirred you up. You see, in 30 years, I've stirred my wife up. I'll guarantee you. May have happened this morning. (laughs) Just kidding. And in that stirring, in that stirring, She has to do what? Love me this way. Amen? How hard is that? Ask her after the service. (laughs) Boy, I owe her a lot of money. I should have gave her 20 this morning. I just want to let you know. (laughs) I'm my own lab rat this morning. (laughs) Uh, Are you loving biblically? Do you always act in love this way, especially when others have stirred you up? This This passage is partly how the Bible scores love. Amen? Now, there's a whole bunch of other ways, but this passage is how the Bible scores love, us connected to one another. As you can see, we have a tendency to keep score in this life, sometimes in good ways, and sometimes, I want to let you know, in really bad ways. This morning, I want to discuss... Another way that we keep score, although many of us would say that we don't keep score this way, but a lot of the time I find that we do. I will get to the subject matter by asking this lead-in question. Here it is. And this is why the Lord took me in a kind of a different way in this passage. Do good works get us into heaven? Now most all evangelical believers, if not all, Evangelical believers will answer this question properly by saying, no. Good works do not get us into heaven. But over the years, I've discovered that many in the body of Christ has a ten- have a tendency to keep score a different way. I've heard it in language used like this, God... Why has this bad thing happened to me? I've been good. I go to church. I read my Bible. And yet, this difficulty is happening in my life while others, here we go. Ready? Keep a score. While others who aren't as spiritual as me seem not to have the problems that I have. That's a keeping score perspective regarding good works. Not only is it a keeping score perspective as it relates to God, but it's a keeping score perspective on others who we consider not walking deeply with God. And thus, to be totally honest with you, that question introduces the idea that they don't deserve the fate you're giving them, God. They don't deserve your blessing. I do. Over the years, I've discovered many professing believers who think God is up in the sky Keeping track of their performance. That's another way of keeping score. Do they have enough good stuff that outweighs the bad stuff so that they are good with God when it comes to the end of life? Paul, in our text for today, is going to address this sort of uh, keeping score. In fact, at the end of this passage, he's actually going to talk about boasting about keeping a score. We pick up the text, verse 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Here we go. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but, it, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy, destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? 
Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for a sign and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are being called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of, foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. So that no man, listen, so that no man may boast before God, but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Who God is and what he has done in Christ is the focus of this portion of the chapter of 1 Corinthians. Paul says, Christ is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are saved, he is the power of God. At the end of this passage, at the end of this passage is what I want to focus our attention on. As it accurately pinpoints what score for us, what score for us is worth keeping... And in fact, Paul goes this far as what his score for us is worth boasting about. Beginning in verse 30, Paul writes, But by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. By Paul's confession, God is not keeping score regarding whether we get into heaven by our good works versus our bad works. In fact, in these verses, just prior to the ones I just read you, Paul blows that whole discussion out of the water. He says, for consider your calling, brethren, that you were, there are not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the, and the despised God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are that no man may boast before God. Paul's point here is this. The very things of the world that we keep score about how someone is wise, how successful someone is, how mighty someone is, are not what impresses God and earns his favor. In fact, the works of men in such vanity are foolishness before God and are nullified by God so that no man, no man can boast before God. According to Paul, man cannot take, care of, take credit for anything and score any points with God. We, we cannot say we deserve to be in heaven with him because we have done this good here or we have done that good here. Paul writes, the only boasting that we can do is to boast in God and what God has done. That's the text of the theology in this passage. Paul writes in the first part of verse 30, but by his doing, God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. There's the proper keeping score, the proper thing to boast about from the scriptures. By God's doing, folks, listen, by God's doing, I'm a believer. Nothing I've done. By his doing, I'm in Christ Jesus. There's the proper keeping a score that we can boast about. There are no good works versus bad works that, God, that moves God to show his favor to me and that I get in. The only way we are in is that God has moved our hearts to him by his doing through the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's the only reason. This morning, I want to set you free from earning his favor. I, just, I want to set you free from earning his favor. By his doing, that statement is tremendously freeing. 
We don't have to do, nor can we do anything that earns God's favor towards us because it is all in his doing. The psalm writer in Psalm 116, beginning in verse 12, expressed it this way. Paul's sentiments this way. He said this, what shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits to me? And then he answers the question, I shall lift up my cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord and ask for more. And ask for more. There's nothing I can offer him that earns his favor. All I can do is lift up my cup of salvation and say, Lord, give me more. Give me more. In other words, the only way I garner his benefits is to is totally by his grace. How outstanding is that thought? How freeing, how freeing is that thought? Have you grabbed a hold of this truth in your life so that you're free from the thoughts that God, God is up in heaven and he's keeping score, weighing your good and your bad and whether you get in or not. Have you been freed from that? You need to be freed from that in Christ this morning. Christ became the wisdom from God for this. Paul continued. Christ became the wisdom from God in righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now, here's what I want to do in the rest of the time we have together this morning is this. These are some really churchy words at the end of this passage, and I want us to wrestle with them to understand. What does Paul mean Christ became wisdom from God? Paul provides what that wisdom from God is in Christ with three churchy words. He speaks of righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. All these terms are fulfilled in Christ Jesus, who, who is the wisdom of God, as he provided Christ for this purpose, these three things. I'll start with the first term, and I'll come back to the, or the last term, and I'm going to come back to the other two. First, Christ became wisdom from God for redemption. Let me offer uh, an example to explain redemption. Now, I'm going to bring it down to uh, you and I and something we do maybe on a regular basis. Have you ever redeemed a coupon? You ever done that? How about this? Have you ever taken bottles back to the store and gotten your nickel? Right? To the redemption center. When you've redeemed a coupon or you've redeemed your bottle to get your nickels back, uh, you'll, you get an example of what... Paul's point is related to redemption. You see, when God the righteous judge calls your sin and my sin into question for judgment and punishment that's due, you have a coupon to redeem, you have a coupon to redeem before God. You have a ticket that's already been punched that had nothing to do with you. It had all to do with God. So you got a coupon that says Jesus Christ on it. And he is your redemption. He has done everything required by the law to provide that redemption. And when you believe, you get your ticket. Amen? You get your ticket. That's what redemption is. Second, Christ became wisdom from God for righteousness. What does that mean? It means that you cannot earn your way to God. You cannot be righteous enough to have God impart his favor to you and let you into his heaven. God, folks, I want to let you know this. God never changed the standard. Amen? Christ said it in the New Testament. I didn't come to abolish law. I came to do what? Fulfill it. God never changed the standard. The standard for entry in heaven is this, perfection. That's the standard. Because he's the righteous judge, and he must punish sin if he's going to be the righteous judge. Amen? So we're in Christ by faith. And here's what happens. When we believe Christ's righteousness is imputed to us, that is the only way that you and I get in. That's the only way our ticket's punched. His righteousness is imputed to us. Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested in Jesus, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all of those who believe. For there is no distinction, distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, deserving his punishment, being justified as a gift by his grace through re the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly 
as a propitiation in his blood through faith. By the way, that word propitiation, very churchy word, what it basically means is the penalty for the sin of all of mankind was put on Christ and his righteous life, his sinless life, his death on the cross for you and me paid that bill. That's what that word means. It paid that bill. This was to demonstrate who's, his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, listen, God passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at, this, as, as the, at the present time so that he would be, the ju- be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. So then Paul asked an interesting question. Where then is the boasting? You and I can boast about nothing. It's all him. Where then is the boasting? It is excluded. It is excluded. By what then? The works of the law? Of works? No. But by the law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works. By faith, Jesus becomes our righteousness. Nothing we've done. God's law requirement, as I mentioned, was perfection, and, G- and it was never changed. And Jesus fulfilled the demands of that, and he is the just payment through the wisdom of God providing his son. By the way, Jesus wasn't an afterthought. Amen? When Adam sinned in the garden, God already knew he was gonna. Jesus was in heaven from him, and God already planned. It pleased him to put his son to death for you and me. Amen? That's the scripture. It pleased him to provide his son. Therefore, when we believe Jesus, when we believe in Jesus, righteousness becomes, Jesus is righteous. When we believe in him, Jesus' righteousness becomes ours. God, the righteous judge, accepts the payment. And actually, in actuality, the righteous judge planned, as I mentioned, planned the payment. If we are to boast in righteousness, the only boasting that we can do in righteousness is that his righteousness, not ours. There's nothing in me. I'm filthy rags. Praise the Lord, I'm filthy rags. It's all about him. Finally, Christ became wisdom from God for sanctification. What does that mean? This means, folks, and I'm trying to change our thought process in this. This means that you are saints, not sinners saved by grace. You're saints who still sin. I'm trying to change our perspective on that. We are saints. We are declared holy. We are declared righteous by Christ. This means that you don't have, you don't have, to listen, this means you don't have to sin anymore as Paul put it in Romans chapter 6. You are freed from sin and have become this, slaves to righteousness. Just as Christ's righteousness is a gift, so is Christ's sanctification. Often, Often, when Jesus healed in the New Testament, he would say to the person that he healed, go and sin no more. That phrase, go and sin no more, is the best definition of that churchy word sanctification that I can give you. Here's what's interesting about it. It is a gift as well. In the wisdom of God through Christ, it's a gift. How do we get the gift of sanctification, which is the ongoing process of our, of our sin being no more? We're becoming Christ followers in Christ's likeness. That's the way I would put it. How do we get that gift of sanctification? Here's what I want to tell you. It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way it comes. That's the only way it comes. In the New Testament, there are a number of narratives where the question about the Holy Spirit is asked this way, have you received the Holy Spirit? Oftentimes, the answer to that question in the New Testament was this, no. And then it was followed by the laying on of hands in prayer so that the Holy Spirit would come and guide the believer into all truth according to Jesus' testimony about the reason the Holy Spirit was going to come in John chapter 16. Folks, there's another reason. There's another biblical score I think we need to be keeping in this. Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit for his sanctifying work in your life? Are you keeping score regarding the wrong stuff? A couple of weeks ago, I was struggling. I didn't know, I don't know, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm learning that God cares deeply about me oftentimes and will prompt people around me to provide me uh, encouragement, which is what we should be doing for one another in Christ by listening to the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Um, and by the way, if that happens to you, I want to encourage you to not, uh, to don't, don't put it aside, do it. 
practice listening to the Holy Spirit and follow up. On this particular day, my sister was praying for me, and she sent me a text to encourage me. She didn't know what I was struggling with. She didn't know my wrestle with uh, uh, the scriptures that day, including my wrestle um, with preparing to preach this message. By the way, the reason I was wrestling with this message is Lord is tremendously speaking into my life because I'm a scorekeeper. I'm reading a book right now by, written about the life of Coach John Wooden. It's written by Pat Williams. I'd suggest it to any of you. It's the seven principles that uh, shaped his life. And I'm wrestling with that book right now because it's speaking into my life about um, this matter of uh, keeping score. Because I, I can be like anyone. I can keep score, especially when um, I, someone stumbles around me and, uh, and I can look at them and I, in their life and I go, go, why? You've been a Christian for so long, Why? I can get into that mode. So my sister sent me this, and it's an excerpt from an article that was on Desiring God, John Piper's website. It was written by a guy by the name of David Mathis, and it said this, when the 72 returned with joy, celebrating that even the demons are subject to them in Jesus' name, he, Jesus, challenges the source of their excitement. And then Jesus says this, do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Rejoice not in the ministry fruit that is yours, but listen, in your Father who made you his. The joy that fed and sustained Jesus himself was not the sermons that he gave, the sick that he healed, even the dead that he raised, but the relationship he had with his Father. The bottom of his joy was not what he did in the world, but whose he was. Did you hear that? It's a relationship question. Where his joy came from. Let me say it again. The bottom of his joy was not what he did in the world, but who he was, whose he was. He delights in being the child of the father. He delights in childlike dependence. There's a bunch of scripture. You can look that up. He delights in receiving from the Father and being known by his Father and knowing his Father. And then this, he delights in bringing others into knowing his Father. Jesus wanted them to keep score differently as it related to the, his relationship with the Father, their relationship with the Father. Paul wants us to boast in the same. Our relationship with the Father, through what the Father has done, what has he done? Our redemption in Christ, our righteousness in Christ, our sanctification in Christ, all of which leads, all of which leads to our names being written in heaven. I'll close with these questions. Are you keeping score? Are you keeping score about the right things or the wrong things? And will you boast in the Lord regarding what he has done, the right things? Let's pray together as the worship team comes to close. God, I thank you for your word. Help us to receive it. Help us to apply it. Help, us, help it to guide us in our walk, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.